Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Armstrong and I'm from TribePad. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. We're going to be talking about how do we stop the bias? That is specifically, how do we stop the biases that are inherent in the recruitment process? So I'm just going to share my screen uh, and then we'll get going. Uh, there will be an opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. Um, so uh, really looking forward to uh, you being on the journey with us this afternoon. OK, so welcome to the webinar. Um, there are many challenges in talent acquisition at the moment. If, if anything, it's busier and harder than ever. We're all uh, expected to do more with less. It's a very candidate driven market. Uh, there's a huge amount of pressure on the business to deliver results uh, in these difficult financial times. Um, but ED&I is more important than ever. Um, very recently, I was at a recruitment leaders event. Uh, the audience was asked, what's the number one topic in your business right now? And far and away, the number one topic with 67% of the room voting for it was actually sourcing candidates from different backgrounds to meet the EDI goals of the business. So a top priority, clearly, for everybody and why we're here today. But really, how much progress has actually been made? EDI has been a topic that's been talked about now for a good 20 years. Um, and we've done some research recently that shows that actually, perhaps we're not making the difference we need to. So we're going to share some ideas today on what we can do about that. First, I'm going to talk you through some research that we've done uh, into bias within the recruitment process. And really what it shows as a headline is we're not making real life change fast enough. And we want to help with that. We think as an industry, we need to do better. Um, recruitment plays such a, hard, a huge part in changing and influencing the culture within a company. Uh, and somebody's employment has such a large impact on their life in terms of their happiness, their wealth and their ability to contribute to, to society. So when there are inequalities and inequity in the recruitment process, inevitably, there's going to be more inequity and inequality uh, in life and society as a whole. So what I'd like you to do first is have a think about what you think are the biggest biases in the recruitment process. So this comes from um, a survey we did to more than 2,000 candidates. It was a, a balance of candidates from uh, gender, ethnicity, you know, across the country, um, people who were um, either in work or actively looking for work. And we asked them, which are the biases you are most worried about in the recruitment process? So you should have a little box up on your screen at the moment with that question. And you've got four options. You can only choose one. Uh, and those options are ethnicity, gender, age and sexuality. So this is, you know, what do you think candidates are most worried about? Um, we'll wait another minute or two. Uh, my marvellous assistants will tell me uh, when uh, loads of people have voted and we'll, we'll finish the vote and we'll, we'll all see the result at the same time. So perhaps give ourselves a little... 10987654321 countdown. And if you haven't voted, it's now too late. So if we can please see the results, that would be marvelous. And the results are okay, interesting. Right. So the number one choice here, 52% of you have gone for age. Um, relatively close behind that, 39% have chosen ethnicity. Um, gender and sexuality, both pretty small there at 5%. So the audience is pretty convinced it's age but there's a good vote for ethnicity as well. So we're gonna come back to that in, in literally just one minute. Before that, I'm just going to take a brief intro, uh, brief minute to, to introduce TribePad to you. So we are on a mission to deliver more smiles at work. Uh, what I mean by that is happier recruiters, happier candidates and happy employees. So we're the trusted technology ally to smarter recruiters everywhere. And, and our talent acquisition software is a springboard for faster, fairer, better recruitment for everyone. Now, we would say that, of course we would, um, but it's not just us. So Fosway, well-known uh, HR tech analysts, uh, they say uh, TribePad is a strategic leader. Um, IDC say we're a major player. So it's not just us who, who are saying that. Okay, enough of the sales spiel. Back to the research. So the results are this. Age is by far and away, so smart panel today, thank you, you were right, age by far is the um, bias that most people are worried about in the recruitment process. Personal appearance, interestingly, is the second. Um, disability comes in third with about 18%. 
Then we're looking at gender or gender identity. Again, similar proportion, about 88%. Um, interestingly, race and, race and ethnicity was smaller down at um, around 15, 16%. So um, not quite what we were expecting. Uh, interestingly there, there's then some other choices around um, weight, um, age as in being too young, whereas perhaps age is too old was our number one choice. Um, people have concerns about accents. They have concerns about how open they should be uh, about their mental health. And um, something that will affect a large number of people is being a parent. So there are other considerations other than just you know age, gender, disability, ethnicity, which are the ones we, we so often go to. Just, just touching back for a second then on, on TribePad and why we did this research and, and why it's something we care passionately about. We, we work with some of the, the best known organisations in the UK. So do you want to swim with a camera under, under the Arctic for David Attenborough on the BBC, be a store assistant uh, in Tesco or a vicar of the Church of England? Um, you will have gone through uh, TribePad software when you've applied for your job in terms of advertising the role, screening candidates, conducting video interviews, offering contracts, onboarding and welcoming. Um, we recently worked um, with NHS professionals to recruit 20,000 COVID vaccinators um, and our software is used by more than 25 million people uh, all over the world in 16 languages. Really importantly, we've got a growing partner ecosystem. So we have more than 100 different integrations for uh, recruitment marketing solutions, sourcing tools, uh, technical and aptitude and language assessments for, for your candidates, background checks, um, ED&I tools, and of course, uh, the leading um, payroll and HR platforms. And one I want to pick out on here today is, is Recite Me, really smart tool that's so easy to plug into your website, um, which um, gives all sorts of accessibility benefits to candidates who find it difficult to interact with your know, traditional web pages. Um, and one last, one last word on TribePad is, we, we, we often fall into that habit. We put the most well-known logos uh, on, our, on our slide of which customers we work with. But actually, the vast majority of organizations we work with are, are much smaller than that uh, in all kinds of sectors. And it's all about helping recruiters deliver you know, fairer, faster, better recruitment outcomes. So we recently launched a product called TribePad Grow, which is for those smaller, growing organizations who want to have a really professional um, recruitment function with all the things that talent acquisition teams need, but it's something that's really simple, low cost and easy to implement. So anyway, I promise that is the last, the last bit of sales. So back, back into the research, the, the next question we followed up with was asking recruiters, what are you currently working on? So we know ED&I is a really important topic, but what is it you're working on right now? Now, really interestingly, this comes out as a complete mismatch to what candidates are worried about. So you'll remember candidates most worried about age. But actually, when you look at what recruiters are implementing in terms of initiatives within the business, whether it's process or whether it's technology or training, ethnicity was the area they were most focused on. Gender was next. Disability was after that. But that you know, accounts for sort of 75% of, uh, of recruiters' focus. But age is actually way down the list with just 41% uh, of recruiters thinking about this. And, and recruitment leaders offered a similar pattern. So really interesting here that what the candidates are worried about, i.e. I'm too old for the job, isn't what recruiters are working on. So are we actually, is this a self-fulfilling problem where because we're not addressing the issue, the issue continues to be at the forefront of people's minds. Now, the next thing we, we looked at was um, the, an issue of trust. So what you'll see on, on, on this uh, question here is we asked candidates, you know, how much do you trust employers when they're asking you to give away your uh, ED&I? When, you know, when you're answering these ED&I questions about gender, age, sexuality, ethnicity, to what extent do you trust the employer's intentions with that? So you'll see the purple bars are those candidates who say, you know, yes, I trust the employer. Uh, orange is no, I don't. And yellow is I'm, I'm not sure. So, so firstly, what we see is, you know, when we look across the board, actually, there's a fairly small proportion um, of people who do trust. And actually, when we, when we tally up the, the oranges and the yellows, about 76% of candidates either don't trust us or are not sure if they trust us. And in my world, if you're not sure you trust somebody, that's pretty much the same as you don't trust them. So, you know, less than a quarter of candidates trust what we're doing with their data when it comes to EDNI. And there's a really strong correlation with age here. You'll see as the graph moves from, from the left to the right, 
you'll see that younger people are more likely to trust. Older people generally are less likely to trust. Now, the question is, why? What are the problems here? How do we address this issue? When is the right time to ask the questions um, about the EDNI process? An interesting uh, challenge that, that's come out from recent census data, for example. So if, if you're aware of the census, this big national survey uh, where every household has to answer all sorts of questions. And for the first time, um, there was a question in there about sexuality and around 3 million people out of a population of just over 60 million in the UK, uh, sorry, in, in England. Um, so three, 3 million out of about 60 million identified as being LGBT uh, plus. But more than double that number, about six and a half million people declined to answer the question. So quite a similar pattern to what we see here in the research of people, you know, why are you asking me that question? I don't feel comfortable giving you that information. So a real challenge for us here as recruiters. Now, if we if we dig into that a little bit deeper, that prefer not to answer. Um, this is a really important um, point. So depending on when you ask, uh, and, and indeed if you ask, because a lot of employers don't ask the question, uh, and in certain countries in the world you can't ask these questions, but the completion rates to these questions, um, for example, you know, tell us uh, how do you identify in terms of your sexuality or what's, what's your ethnicity, if you ask those questions right at the beginning of uh, the application process, you tend to get quite a high dropout rate, i.e. a lot of people will click prefer not to answer. If you ask the questions much later in the process, for example, at the point you're, uh, you've already given a verbal offer, for example, and you're working through the contract, you get a far, far higher um, proportion of people who will answer the questions uh, truthfully and, and, a, and a much smaller pe uh, proportion of people who will say, I prefer not to answer. So that sort of logically makes sense, doesn't it? So we then asked uh, these candidates in this survey, well, when do you think is the right time to, to ask these questions? And we've got about 19% say, actually, I don't think you have any business asking these questions at all in recruitment. You, you shouldn't do it. Just 11% of people, um, which is the purple uh, portion at the top there, just 11% think we should ask the questions right at the front. Now, I think what we have here is, is what I call is, is a data paradox. So as recruitment professionals, um, you know, if, if we work in this circular methodology of you've got a hypothesis, you test it, you try it out, you get the results and then you learn and you go again, you know, this, this iterative process of improvement. If you want to improve the balance of perhaps female candidates making it through to late stage or candidates from a black, Asian or minority ethnicity making it through the, the SIFT, you need to be able to measure that before and after. You know, if you're taking some actions in your, your process, whether it's implementing technology, whether it's training programs or anti-bias workshops, whatever it is, you sort of need to be able to measure before and after to understand if the action you've taken has improved the situation. But actually what candidates are telling us is we don't want to give you that data at the beginning of the process. So that's a real challenge for us in terms of, well, how do we therefore make improvements and test if what we're doing to drive better ED&I outcomes, ED outcomes is, is actually making it better? Now, I'll give you one example of um, unintended consequences. So this is um, good people trying to do a good thing and actually having the exact opposite effect of what they wanted. Now, uh, this isn't used a lot in the UK, but in America, something called ban the box uh, is quite popular in the recruitment process. So ban the box is all about the idea that um, on some job application forms, there's a little box to tick that says, do you have any unspent convictions that we need to know about? Or do you have any you know, criminal, uh, criminal convictions that we need to know about? And you have to tick that box. Now, what the, the evidence showed was that... Um, that caused a lot of people to drop out because they didn't want to tick that box and caused all sorts of bias in the process. So recruiters across the board started removing that question from their application process, which you'd say, that sounds like a good thing. You know, we don't want to discriminate against people who've made some mistakes earlier in their life, have, have you know, served their punishment and are now looking to rehabilitate. Of course, that's, that's a good thing. And there's really, really good talent pools to be had in, in ex-offenders. We, we all know that. But what happened here 
was there was actually more discrimination against young black male candidates because hiring managers suspected they might have a criminal record, so were less likely to shortlist and interview them. So even though the box had been removed and even though the intention was good, actually it's had a worse effect in that fewer young black male candidates were making it through the process. So this you know, really highlights how important this data is. Now, the final thing we asked, uh, we asked um, the recruiters was around what technology initiatives are you implementing? What things are you putting in place to try to improve the EDI outcomes of, uh, of your recruitment process? Now, overwhelmingly, a large proportion of people were looking at um, tools to make the text of their job applications more inclusive. So there's a tendency for um, job adverts to say, you know, we want a dynamic candidate, which is, you know, code for we want you to be young. Uh, they might have very masculine, powerful words in which discourages female candidates from applying, all, all these sorts of things. So encouragingly, lots and lots of organisations are looking for tools to address this problem. But when we look at something like um, blind applications or anonymous applications, blind CVs, only about a third of customers uh, and, and, and sorry, recruiters who we surveyed um, are looking at actively looking at implementing that sort of thing. Now, that's really interesting because there's an absolute ton of academic research out there that shows that um, you know, CVs are a terrible way to recruit people. They, they have about 100 and something uh, biases inherent in the process, not a very good predictor of how successful somebody will be in the role. And yet candidates are actually very wedded to CVs. Hiring managers are very wedded to CVs. And it seems to be really, really difficult to change. Now, at TribePad, we've um, had a... Um, anonymous applications module in our platform for about six or seven years now. Um, but actually, last year, just 2% of roles were um, used that anonymous application process. Now, that's nearly 100% increase on the year before, which was only 1%. So, okay, great news. It's, it's increased 100%. But we're still only talking about 2% of roles. So, so there's a long way to go. We actually had a, a customer forum recently where we suggested well, what if we turned on anonymous applications by default across all roles and then you disable it where, where you want to disable it? And uh, there was nearly mutiny at the idea that we would do something like that. So, so clearly the market is interested in anonymous applications and sort of knows it's a good thing to do, but for various reasons, isn't quite ready to, to make that leap. So having looked at the research, uh, let, me, let me take you through now a couple of ideas about how we think um, technology can actually help you make a real difference. So the first is in the area of attracting diverse candidates in, in the first place. This is a, a screenshot of the Evenbreak job board. Now, Evenbreak uh, as an organization, they are run uh, entirely by people with disabilities for candidates with disabilities. Been hugely successful during COVID. Um, Jane Hatton, CEO, she's a really inspirational woman. Literally, that organization is changing people's lives by helping candidates with disabilities get into some really, really rewarding jobs. And this is just one example. There's loads and loads of different tools out there. There's the Diversity Job Boards group who have eight or nine different boards targeted at different groups of uh, people from different backgrounds. Um, if you haven't come across them, I'd thoroughly recommend Restless. So it's Restless. Uh, and that's very much targeted at sort of over 55s market, which is hugely important because there's so many skills uh, in that marketplace. People looking to make a difference who are often overlooked. And as you know, as we saw in the candidate research, the number one concern was people who's being viewed as they're too old. So I would say, you know, the first place to go is ser actively searching these job boards for candidates. Actively advertising your roles to these job boards can make a really big difference in terms of the, the mix of candidates that you bring into your business in the first place. Um, touching now on that, that anonymous applications, we've worked with Coventry City Council uh, for a number of years now, about five years. And as a, as a local government authority in the public sector, it's really, really vital that they actually represent their community. So they had a wide initiative uh, to look at how they posted the jobs, how they described the job um, adverts, what was in the job descriptions. Um, they implemented some end-to-end -end reporting and they used our anonymous applications process. And what they saw was an increase in applications from candidates from black, 
uh, Asian and minority ethnicity background increased from 18% of applications to 39%. Now that's important for two reasons, those numbers, 18% and 39%. Firstly, it's a massive increase. You know, we're talking about it's, it's pretty much doubled. But secondly, the population makeup of Coventry is actually 41% people from BAME backgrounds. So they've gone from having, you know, less than half the representation they should in their workforce to almost, almost a matching population. So a really positive step in the right direction in terms of ethnicity. At the same time, they've seen um, a significant increase in the number of um, females hired directly into management roles, and they also saw an increase in the number of candidates with disabilities coming into the business. So a really, really positive change here. And when we look a little wider across uh, our other customers, as I mentioned, we, we've got anonymous applications uh, in our platform, have done for a, a long time. We actually worked on the B, with the BBC to develop it in the first place. And then we've seen local government adopting it, professional services, and then other markets where there are challenges. So, for example, engineering, construction, legal, things like that, people where they know they want to make a difference. So what you see here on the left hand side is instead of seeing the candidate's name, it just says candidate 55. Uh, instead of seeing their location, it says anonymized. And then what happens is the, the hiring managers will sift those candidates based on the scores that they and the answers they've given to um, the questions without actually knowing their background, reducing the chance that a decision is going to be made based on conscious or, or unconscious bias. Then once the candidate's selected to interview, well, of course, at that point, you have to reveal the details because you need to be able to talk to the candidates at, the, at that point. So when we actually looked across, uh, we, we did some analysis across eight different local government authorities who, who were using it. And between them, they saw an 18 percent increase in the number of interviews of candidates from BAME backgrounds. So, again, a, a really significant success. It's not all about anonymous applications, of course. Accessibility, we, we touched on at the beginning there, and it's something that's that's really, really important. So we've worked with uh, Sodexo, who are a really large employer in the UK, um, disability confident leader status. And, and as part of getting that status, we made sure that the technology solution supported their ethos, supported their process in making sure that everybody has the best chance um, to shine in the interview process. And I think that's one of the things I'd, I'd, I'd draw out from this is, you know, we, we, we're aware of reasonable adjustments. You know, we want to ask candidates, um, you know, any reasonable adjustments you'll need in order to, to meet this interview or to meet this job. But actually a far more positive way of saying this, uh, there's a guy called Theo, who's, who's really, really popular on LinkedIn, talks about neurodiversity all the time. Uh, and his, his whole point is give the candidate the chance to shine, you know, Give them a choice of phone or video interview or face to face. Um, give them a choice of actually getting the interview questions up front so they can think about their answers. So, you know, it's really being about being switched on to what are the things that we can do to, to help candidates? You know, is that about making um, specific information available to those candidates who say they have some accessibility issues so that you can help them? Is it about automatically flagging and shortlisting? So on the screen here, you might see the little disability icon. This is for one of our customers, where as soon as a candidate identifies as having disabilities, uh, it triggers all sorts of other activities where they proactively ask, contact that candidate and ask them, how can we help um, you make the most of this interview and give your best? And how do we make sure we fully understand what you need in order to give your best in the interview process? It's a really positive way of making a real difference. And it compounds because as soon as you do that, you have those characters in your business they're positively changing your culture. They're far more likely to then share their stories in terms of, um, you know, employee case studies. Suddenly you then have videos, images and stories on your website that underpin your ethos and support your employer value proposition. Um, and it becomes a virtuous circle because you can attract more and more candidates. The, the last point I'd make about how, how technology can, can help is really around the area of reporting. You know, we've said before, if you want to make a change, test, find the conclusions, and then and then go again. You've got to have the data to be able to understand what does your application pool look like, which candidates with different protected characteristics are making it through which stages, where are the blockages in the process, you know, analyze, drill down per job, drill down per hiring manager and recruiter. Are there some um, outlying results that are worthy of digging into? And that can be positive and negative, right? You might have 
a particular manager in a particular department who always seems to hire the middle-aged white guys. Um, maybe there's something you can go and look at there, compare him to um, other candidates to see what is he potentially doing wrong? Is there some training needs there or is there a process problem? Likewise, more positively, you might have a team who's doing incredibly well, smashing all their targets. They've got a really high performing, diverse team of individuals. What are they doing right? How do we share that best practice out across the organization? Having the data and being able to drill down is, is key to making those sorts of decisions. So I want to leave you uh, with four key takeaways before we go into the, the Q&A. The first of that is it's clear that not enough progress is being made. There's, there's a very famous study where um, a CV is sent out to hundreds of different employers. And let's say it says the name of the person is Fred Smith. And they'll get a, 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 a response rate. And then they'll change the name to be something that's typically Asian, let's say. And the response rate drops. And then they'll include a picture of an Asian person on that um, CV, perhaps with some sort of headdress, and the application rate drops again. Quite depressing that, that these biases are in society. But what's interesting about it is this survey has been run every two or three years since the 1980s, and the results last year were almost exactly the same as they were 20 years ago. So we're not making enough change, but nobody actually has a silver bullet. And, and we at Tripad, we don't claim to have all the answers. And change needs people and process technology to, to come together and be you know, clearly aligned. I think the second thing that we'd leave you with is actually we need to take some action and the industry needs to come together to solve these problems. You know, we need to get EDI experts, we need in-house recruitment teams, we need technology providers, and we must have candidate input as well. Um, probably government, right? How do we make the change and make our recruitment process fairer? Because we know what a big impact it can have on society for the good. The data paradox. I touched on this earlier. If we need data to improve and iterate our process, but the candidates don't trust us to answer those EDI questions, how do we deal with that? Do we have to mandate it by law, for example, that 100% of jobs you have to have this question and therefore there's less suspicion? I don't know what the answer is here, but how do we also um, avoid these unintended consequences of good people trying to do good things and inadvertently causing a worse outcome? So my final point would be, you know, there is a wealth of data out there that shows things like anonymous applications, randomized questions and answers, panel scoring, uh, real life work assessments. All of these things are so much better than a CV in an interview. They're so much fairer. There's less bias and they're more likely to correlate with a successful hire. Um, a partner of ours uh, you might have heard of called Arctic Shores. They have some really cool candidate assessments, some really good psychology backed assessments, um, and they're all about scrapping the CV. And you know, we thoroughly believe in that because we want recruitment to be fairer, faster and more effective. So we'll open up for uh, Q&A at this point. Uh, everybody who's registered for, for the webinar today, thank, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we'll send you a, a copy of our, uh, our new survey, which is around uh, salary, security and purpose, understanding what candidates are thinking and feeling at the moment. Um, we also have a pretty interesting um, guide on how to build a compelling business case. So you can scan the QR code on, on the next slide, uh, and that'll take you to that business case if you're interested. So let me flick forward to that now, and I'll ask if there are any questions in the audience. Hi, Neil. We've had a question through from Melanie Francis. She asks, was neurodiversity an option and how does this factor into the research? Uh, thanks, Melanie. Um, so was neurodiversity an option on the, the, ten, the 10 choices? Um, I'm guessing is, is the, the question here. Uh, let me just stop sharing my, uh, my screen a second. So, so I'm guessing that question is about was neurodiversity uh, an option? Um, I can't remember, but it didn't make it into the top 10 of answers if it was there as an option. But thank you for the question. I had another question through asking, why do you think age bias was the largest reported concern? Yeah, interesting. Um, and uh, I, I, I wasn't expecting age to be the number one, but, but clearly the, the panel, the, 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 the attendees of, the, of the, today's webinars were, were clearly uh, more educated than me. 
I think once we looked into the data, it became reasonably clear that actually everybody gets old, whereas not everybody identifies as LGBT, not everybody has a, an, a, an ethnicity that, that isn't white British, and therefore it's just a numbers game in that everybody gets old, therefore there were more old people than there were black people, for example. And we've had another one through. Um, what can we do as recruiters instead of asking for CVs? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this is a really big one. And I think this is probably one of the, um, I was going to say easiest changes that recruiters can make. Um, it's not that easy. We, we know hiring managers are very wedded to CVs. But instead of saying, you know, please send me your CV, how about asking some structured questions about um, what experience do you have in this industry? Do you have this qualification? Do you have that qualification? Or, or perhaps even better, some you know, situational judgment tests. What would you do in this situation? How would you handle this uh, conflict? Give us some, you know, give us some evidence of, of this skill that you have. So I would say those are better ways of capturing the information you need from the CV that you're doing that initial screening on. Um, and then all the evidence shows that actually asking some real life work based questions and doing some work based tests. So, you know, for example, if you're hiring a developer, um, ask them to write some code, which is representative of the sort of thing they're doing. Um, we, we have a, a, a customer in the retail sector and a key part of their recruitment process uh, is they get somebody in store for a day and they literally come in, you know, they're paid, but they, they, they come and work in the store for a day. And a successful day in the store is the sort of the final part of their of their interview process because it represents exactly what the work is going to be. So, um, yeah, that, that's what I'd say as an alternative to a CV. Carol Woods has also asked us if we can share more information or examples of the job boards that support certain sectors of the population. Great question, Carol. Yeah, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, the, the, I think I mentioned a couple. So one was called Restless, which is Restless, and I think it's restless.co.uk. Uh, there's evenbreak.co.uk. Um, there's one called the Diversity Job Boards Group. Um, a guy called Joe Sweeney runs that organization, and they've got uh, seven or eight different different boards, um, ex-forces, ex-prison, um, disability based uh, ethnicity based uh, sexuality based all, all kinds of different different avenues but yeah there's lots out there and we'll yeah good idea we'll share some after this call and the last question that's come through is does using video interviewing introduce more bias ah okay that's an interesting one and i think that was certainly before um covid pandemic that that was a big concern people had about well surely if we're you know getting people on video people are going to make judgments about their age their their looks their ethnicity their accent um, perhaps even what's in the background of their video you know is it is it like a scruffy bedroom and you you're wearing a crumpled t-shirt or or are you in a, a an office with a smart shirt you know there's all kinds of things you can interpret from from video but I think. We uh, we have a video interviewing platform and, and we work with some other video interviewing platforms as well. One of the things that, that you know, we would consider when we look at that is there are some benefits. If you have a, a phone call, for example, a screening phone call with a candidate, that's probably not recorded. It's probably not transcribed. In order to make that call, you already have to know the person's name and uh, you can make some judgments about their, their accent as well. So actually those same biases that we were worried about on video already exist. Not, not only that, you don't know what questions they've been asked or, or what the intonation was. So one of the benefits of uh, a, a, an asynchronous video interviewing platform is firstly consistency. You know every candidate is being asked exactly the same question in exactly the same way, and they all have the um, equal opportunity to, to respond. I think the second thing is, once that video has come back into the platform, you can actually have four, five, six different people all score those answers with a consistent scoring matrix. So again, you can reduce some bias and get some consistency. And you can also start to uh, measure your hiring managers. So you might start to spot this manager is consistently favoring uh, female candidates over male candidates. This uh, hiring manager is consistently favoring white candidates over other candidates. So I think there's pros and cons. Um, what we did see, of course, was um, you know, a huge uptake of video interviewing during the pandemic. Um, and it doesn't seem to have caused enormous problems that, that we can see. 
But post pandemic, actually, lots of businesses have gone back to face to face interviews with all the inherent bias that that, that um, includes. So I'm not sure. Um, personally, I would say video interviewing doesn't make it worse. It solves some of the problems, but not all of the problems. We have another question through. Yep. You mentioned AI and Recite Me. Do you have any other helpful insights regarding this to help with online form completion? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. So, um, I mean, yeah, certainly recommend Recite Me. They're, they're worth uh, having a look at in terms of making your, your site more accessible. Um, that there are all kinds of uh, consultants out there who can who can help as well in terms of um, assessing your site for, for usability for, for all kinds of different users. Um, and it's not just in the actual code of how the site works, but it's also in the language that's used uh, and how you think about you know the different different audiences. So uh, yeah, that, that's certainly worth looking into. Um, whether whether AI can help. Um, I think is yet to be proven. It's certainly going to be faster than than people sifting people, um, but I have some concerns about you know how fair the the technology is and how much we understand how the AI will work. Um, so it's something that needs I think a bit more bit more exploration and um, a bit more understanding before we let it entirely loose on the, on the recruitment process. So I think that's our last uh, question for, for today. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining us. I hope that's been useful. And uh, yeah, do come and visit tripod.com and, and we'd love to talk to you and see if we can help you improve your EDNI, com EDNI outcomes in your recruitment process. So thanks very much.